Hi guys and welcome to another episode of JDM Masters and on today's car reviews we have a very old Toyota. Was it a Lexus? Well it is the Toyota Celsio which is also known as the Lexus LS400. This is the JDM model and we're going to be talking about it going for a little review so if you want to know more about this car come join us. The relentless pursuit of perfection. That is the motto of Lexus, which is a luxury brand and arm of Toyota Motor Company. Now, back in 1986, A.G. Toyota, the then president of the Toyota Motor Company, decided that he would use the technology and the advancement of Toyota Motor Company to take on the very, very best of luxury marks of Europe, namely Mercedes-Benz and BMW in their home territory. And it's something that the bubble economy that benefited many Japanese manufacturers, auto manufacturers, uh, construction companies, electronic, it was something that was going on at that time. Japan was at the forefront of electronical and mechanical advancement and the quality and also manufacturing and attention to detail, craftsmanship was all something that uh, the world uh, really respected. And in the field of automobiles, uh, Japan still yet to prove that they could use and master that technology into making something that would beat the established brands of the very, very best. Now, in the 1980s, the European marks were at the top of their range, whether it's supercars or luxury cars. It was also a joint effort, maybe intentionally and unintentionally, for each of their brands to do what they were really good at in order to take on Europe's best and beat them at their game. Honda with the NSX used their technology to build a mid-engine all aluminum body supercar to take on Ferrari and Porsche. Um, Mitsubishi and, and Subaru did, later dominated the World Rally Championship taking on the likes of Lancia and Ford. And it was up to Toyota who were already very established with their Toyota crown and the Century. The Toyota Century which was built in the 1960s meant for royal family service. Uh, showed that Toyota could build the very best luxury cars, but it was a different style. And the CEOs or the would-be bosses uh, in, the, in the European world, the businessmen who desired a car that could take on and satisfy their luxurious needs, uh, was still something that to be met. The crown wasn't really introduced overseas uh, because it was a very Japanese taste. It was very particular. Toyota in 1987 decided to take their technology and take it a step further to prove that they could achieve contradicting values of performance but yet having good fuel economy, uh, more luxury and more quietness but yet at a lower cost. And thus was born the Project F1. Now, it's not related to anything racing but we'll see later why. The Toyota Celsio was a brand that was marketed in Japan rather than the Lexus. So let's go a little bit into the history of what Lexus is. Toyota had a very strong market in North America, but that was just for the commuter Coronas and Corollas and some Land Cruisers. In order to take on the very best, they couldn't just feel the crown. They set their sights on the top of the European mark models that were respected for their status and for their performance, but also the history. The Mercedes-Benz S-Class was their target. The Toyota then decided that they could build something even better than that. But what was to come out of it? Now, if you look at this body here, it looks like a contemporary styled European car, 
uh, it's a three box, very long, quite low a grill. Uh, it's really prominent in the front, it's square. This is actually the second model, the UC20, which kind of looks similar to the original LS400 or the UC10. Now this model was built in order to be an evolution of the first model. It shares the same 4 litre V8 90 degree 32 valve 1 UZFE and that was the hallmark of the engine. So Toyota decided that in order to understand what luxury is, it had to have better performance. In order to achieve better fuel economy, they needed to build a new engine. So let's look a little bit at the styling of the Toyota Celso or the Lexus LS400. Class C 3 box design with a really long midsection and a huge trunk. This was the epitome of luxury standards. But back in the 90s, it wasn't about pomp. It wasn't about showing off that you had wealth. It wasn't meant to be eye-catching or you know, overly attractive. It was understated comfort and understated dignity in presenting that you had means to achieve that sort of lifestyle. Probably aimed more at self um, style entrepreneurs rather than the Toyota Crown's uh, status symbol for high ranking senior managers in big Japanese corporations. Uh, if you wanted to, you know, pilot your own car to show that you had made it in the world of business, that was the point of the Celsior, which was also put in the same class as the Toyota Crown, but it had two different target markets. Now, of course, being disguised in Japan uh, as a, as a Celsior meant that the foreign market enjoyed a new luxury brand. But in 1989, when it was introduced, it was a newcomer in a world of established luxury players. So let's have a look at what the Toyota Celsius stood for, the Japanese back in the late 80s and the early 90s. The success of the original UC10 LS400 really showed that Toyota had the ability to give uh, performance and luxury uh, for their booming economies uh, would-be entrepreneurs at that age. One thing that really attracted the customers was the price. An equivalent spec Mercedes SC or SEL would be priced at about almost 10 million yen. The BMW, maybe 1 million, yes. This, uh, in the highest C specification, was only about 6 million yen. In fact, adjusted for for inflation, the new LS500 you can buy today is about three times more, but that's still cheaper than the equivalent uh, current S-Class. So how is it possible to offer more quality, better performance, but yet still be at a cheaper price value? And that comes from Toyota's massive empire for manufacturing and acquiring parts, but yet the attention to detail, working in small groups, and researching very, very carefully in order how to reduce parts uh, production and also make it efficient for manufacturing. That's the Toyota way. If you're interested, you can probably look deeper into the history of what the Toyota empire and see how they can produce uh, really good cost performance value products. In any range, you have the luxury uh, standard, you have the bread and butter uh, Corollas, you have the uh, hardcore and very rugged uh, Land Cruisers, but also the everyday uh, Priuses. In fact, most Toyotas these days have a hybrid option, but not this. In 1980s and the 90s, it was about big power, big engine. The one UZFE, which we're going to be exploring later, was quite a unique and groundbreaking engine for Toyota. Now, why would you want a luxury car? Now, if you're going to have a luxury car, you've got to have it big. And that was what cars like the S-Class, the 7 Series, and of course, the new upstart in the, in the late 80s, the LS and the Toyota Celso was all about. The total length is just shy of five meters with a width of 1.8 meters long, wheelbase of 2.850 millimeters long. And this is gonna be standing out on the road as you drive through the streets of Tokyo or New York or in London or wherever you may be. It is a status symbol, but a simple styling of clean lines, uh, straight running through the body uh, without any overly dramatic creases. And you can see here how the bottom path 
is also separated in a very typical Japanese fashion. It was also style uh, back in those days. Uh, without any dramatic lines that you would find in sports cars, is to keep it a sort of dignified uh, sort of design that's meant to ferry high-ranking officials of companies or your self-styled businessmen in a nice quiet, wafting comfort. It's also a 90s styling, uh, which of course comes from uh, the styling of the 80s, to have wide glass area. You can see how the width or the height of the glass is almost, almost proportional to three quarters of the door. You won't find it in cars these days. The waistline of these cars means it could provide a very wide view of vision. In fact, this is also true for most other cars of that age. But in the long, big body of a sedan like this, this is where it's concentrated on. You can see how length of the rear window is almost longer than the driver's side. The rear seat is where the LS400's passengers find the utmost comfort. Let's move a little bit long to the back. Like most cars in the 1980s and 90s, it was a very simple affair. Straight rectangular lights that, that cover a large part of the trunk, it's run a straight line, which gives it a sign of status. And that status means it's just simple. But if you look deeper, the gentle straight line that comes down with a protruded bumper, which is also highlighted by an important chrome stripe here, signifies that this is not just your ordinary bread and butter model. Of course, you won't find that in cars these days because all these different complicated lines that crisscross each other. But having also a huge long trunk space means you could put a lot of golf bags, uh, travel bags, or you know, picking up people from the airport. These cars were also in Japan were used as uh, a limousine hire taxi of sorts. In fact, companies uh, bought it for their high-ranking officials and uh, many taxi services also used this uh, for their, their higher customers. Uh, the, the rear windscreen is wide and big with a good vision out from the rear, but also the all-important accessory that uh, the CEO must have are these curtains gently closing in order to shut in the privacy of its occupants as they go for an important meeting or maybe a serious business deal. What you will find in this car is under the skin. It's a lot of the technology that Toyota had put into making it possibly the quietest and the smoothest sailing or still delivering the most fuel economy and power compared to its rivals in the original UC10. The UC20 takes a step further by putting even more power and still besting its competition even at that equivalent in 1994. And when this car first came out, many reviewers think it's nothing different from, they can't even tell the difference from the previous model. This car is actually the facelift version of the UC20. It's slightly restyled headlights but still maintaining that simple elegance of the Toyota brand. Now Toyota being Toyota, of course, it's a rather conservative company, especially back in the 90s. Maybe not so now, as you can see with the new designs of their Lexuses and also the Crowns and that crazy grill of the Alpha. You would never think that they'd come from such humble origins as this. But such was the culture of uh, the bubble economy to show your wealth. So let's take a look at some mechanical details under the hood. Now, of course, opening a bonnet of a luxury car like this must be a simple, one-touch, easy affair. Opens with the grill, gas struts, and here you see the huge 1UZ FE V8 engine. We're standing out here in Daikoku, but it's freezing cold, so kind of good to warm my hands on this plastic heater under the radiator. Now, the 1UZ FE was created from the ground up, and it was also Toyota's first production V8 engine engineers con contemplated whether they would be able to use existing technology such that they only had inline sixes at the time was used in the crown but they decided that in order to beat uh, the Europeans in performance a new engine had to be created their goals were to have more power but also with superior fuel economy now the 1980s was a, a time of revolutionary electronic technology and a lot of gadgets 
um, in the intake system or the exhaust system, for example, the like, ECUs were also used for fuel injection. It was the only way in order to achieve um, a better fuel economy while delivering power. Toyota, like other Japanese companies, were really uh, adept at using uh, electronic technology without the use of turbochargers uh, to, to make this very, very different from Europeans. In fact, the equivalent Mercedes engine was a single cam. This was a four valve per cylinder technology, giving a total of 32 valves at a 90 degree V8 angle. What's special about this is that it is actually closer to a racing engine. Now, of course, Toyota had uh, experience with uh, certain Le Mans racer cars uh, already from the 70s to the 80s and with their uh, TRD motorsports on. Of course, this is not official things, but if you look at the specs of uh, the, this V8 engine with the short stroke and the proportions uh, the, of the bore to the, uh, to the stroke and also the design of the crankshaft, even if you look at the way the pistons are designed, uh, the second generation one user FV with the VVTi, which is a like variable cam phase time on the intake, it looks very much like a racing engine. In fact, if you look into uh, famous racing engine maker Toda Racing, they actually have a racing engine based on this. And larger versions like the 2UZ uh, were used in um, many competition trucks and also in V8 racing in America and also in Japan. So putting an engine that had racing technology meant that it was able to produce power smoothly, um, of course at a high level, but such is not necessary for a luxury car. Putting all those higher tolerances into the engine meant that power could be delivered as smoothly as possible. And it's very evident uh, when one drives one of these uh, classics. Now there's something interesting about the technology back in the uh, late 80s. Now the pistons were hyper eutectic, fancy word, but this meant that the alloy used in the pistons had a higher amount of silicon, which helps it to be built to higher tolerances, which is important for cold start, which is one of the factors that would affect whether fuel economy and emissions would be met. Using this technology, which was a lot cheaper than having forged pistons, it was not necessary because it doesn't really rev very high, uh, was something new and revolutionary back then. Cars these days, uh, in many engines, have this very basic technology. But back in the late 80s, this was something revolutionary. Carried over to, of course, the second generation with improved um, parts uh, throughout the whole engine. Uh, of course, the crankshaft, uh, the valve design. It was something a little bit different from what the European approach would be. Now, power was up from the 250 horsepower from the original uh, UC10 to 265 for the first pre-facelift of the next generation. And on this 1997 onwards facelift with the VVTi, it had 290 PS, slightly more than the gentleman's 280 uh, agreement. But in Japan, no one had to know. Most importantly was how the torque was delivered. 40 kilograms from a 4-litre engine was achieving um, its potential. Fed through an improved 5-speed gearbox, which at the time was considered a luxury. Of course, compared to 8-speed or 10-speed uh, transmissions of today, may somehow feel, on paper at least, a bit lacking. But the gear ratios are well spread out uh, for the amount of power that it delivers. In fact, driving it, you hardly feel any of the shifts. Now, looking at the engine in the engine bay, and you can see how it's put far enough back in the firewall in order to give it a very good balance. In fact, for such a long sedan, the weight distribution is about 53% in the front and a lot of it is due to uh, lightweight materials of the alloy, uh, cylinder block, and also the cylinder head. Uh, extra care has been taken to lay out and optimize space, uh, which is a very Japanese engineering thing, um, even back then. Uh, the C-Spec is equipped with the uh, pneumatic dampers, which was a technology that Toyota used back then called TEMs, uh, which had the electric modulating hydraulic control that absorbs all of these uh, road irregularities also gives it a much more sportier handling uh, than the European contemporaries. It was very interesting because it was trying to achieve what BMW, which is known for a more sporting uh, brand, even in, in the luxury class, and Mercedes, which was considered to be a more luxury oriented, and combined these things and still made it better. And each generation of the Celso, which later became the LS, could still beat European cars and even other competitors in the Japanese field. Of course, when it comes to luxury 
luxury cars, Toyota really knows how to do it well. And we're going to be taking a look at also the suspension. And you can see here uh, from these reference photos how they chose to use double wishbone uh, for the front and also the rear. And the rear is interesting because most of the upper arms are also contained uh, within the wheel, wheel housing and the suspension dampers uh, come up very high, which gives it enough space for a lot of trunk room. Hard to manage and, and organize the layout of a double wishbone suspension, especially in a luxury car. But this was nothing new as Toyota had used it already in the Crown. The front is a high mount uh, wishbone, which also gives it superior road handling, especially at high speeds. Now, there's something that we want to show you about how unique this engine is and why it could beat its competitors. And it's got to do with absolute smoothness. And the Toyota in their approach to make sure that this engine really beat Europe's best, it got to prove one thing. Now, in order to prove the absolute smoothness and stability of this engine, the original LS400 was able to run at 180 kilometers an hour and still not break or spill a single drop of wine from the wine glass. And you can see in this reference video in Best Motoring how they put a pyramid a stack of glasses on the roof and also in the engine and rev the engine high and it was running at 180 kilometers an hour. Nothing happens. And I'm going to prove it today having this glass of water in a wine glass. I'm going to put it right here and we'll start the engine. Not even a flinch. I guess we should go to our next point then. Now, having no vibrations in the engine meant that the occupants, who were most important people who sat in the rear seat, would be able to relax and sleep and listen to their classical music. There's a lot of amenities, as you can see here. Not just one light, but two lights. And a very interesting hospitality-driven aircon vent. Not only the center, that's not enough. You had to have another one like a first-class flight from New York to Tokyo. Oh, and I forgot to mention, these seats in the Toyota Celso are a bit different from the export version. They're not leather. They're made of the very best Japanese wool. It's something that's different in the way luxury or comfort is perceived in Japan. You see, unlike leather, when you sit on wool, it doesn't make any squeaking noises. Now, the Japanese do not consider leather to be equally luxurious because of the sound it makes when it squeaks, and that is not luxury. So the CEO sits in his car, and he's going from Ginza, where his office is, is preparing for a 350-kilometer trip to Nagoya, sat in the back of his Toyota Celsius and of course he needs to sleep just with the touch of this button the seat pushes forward and you can higher up the electronically controlled everything in the rear seat and to achieve that first class luxurious standard and of course control the aircons from behind or maybe a bottle of whiskey or some, or some wine or Listen to your favorite cassette tape on your Celsius branded, obviously Sony Walkman. And you put your cassette tape here. I wonder who uses cassettes anymore. Budget answer to the karaoke system in the Toyota Century. But that's more than enough because all he needs is to just relax and sleep. Oh, and by the way, all of these materials in the Lexus or the Toyota Century or the Toyota Celsius, the Crown, have the same sort of very soft touch feel and high quality materials that are always present in all of their cars, uh, even until today. But there's something different about the way just 90s material feels and even the way it appears. Uh, you can see the gentle creases, uh, which uh, looks like, you know, it's a sort of fox pass leather, but it's simple, also nicely plush of wool fabric uh, 
with just enough leather to give it that little luxury. And this is real um, wood, by the way. And something that's uh, also a culture of the 80s and 90s is to have an ashtray, the cigarette lighter. Now, obviously, they didn't launch the Lexus brand in Japan, but there are hints of Lexus inside. In fact, the E and the L is exactly the same font as the word Lexus. And this is indicating that it's direct a relationship to the LS400. Now, the catalog itself, luxury item from the 90s thinking, highest grade Japanese paper, rice paper right in the front, and it says here, the relentless pursuit of perfection, which is exactly the same motto that Lexus carries on. Now, these two pages explain all of their R&D and their goals to achieve each aspect of the car, uh, whether it's in the sound system, uh, whether it's in the crash test ability, the handling and high speed ability, and to achieve um, the ultimate quietness and smoothness. And there's many pages here describing um, how they've done a lot of research and, and hundreds of miles of test and the colors. But here, we're gonna to turn to this, past these beautiful pictures, this page here. Oh, and here is what the leather looks like. Notice how it's quite different from current day leather seats. Uh, cars in the 80s and the 90s, even with the European contemporaries, had a sort of crease in the center, which kind of made it look a bit like a sofa. But there were many various grades throughout its life cycle, um, the A being the lowest, the B, the mid-grade, and here we have the C. But leather was an option for the Japanese. Kyle, thanks for joining in. In your car. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to turn this on and um, just enjoy all these so many buttons here and so many settings i mean the businessman who just you know bought one of these must be so confused by all these little controls and what it, you know what it, what it does but in the other way it's actually laid out in a very very systematic um, and logical way as well i what i like most about this is that everything is placed ergonomically within reach and um, of course, it's a very 90s thing to have uh, as many buttons as possible. The more buttons, um, you know, means that it's got more functionality. But one of my favorite features of this um, car is this electroluminescent um, backlit uh, instrument cluster. And it's got a nice mixture of analog, but also uh, the early digital, like in the digital gauge there. And uh, it's got a trip computer. You press the function. It would show um, average fuel economy and um, you know, range and on all these functions. Uh, it's just the same as what well, cars we have. The, but I imagine back this in that I had 1997, it was pure luxury, wasn't it? Yeah, even like this light right here. Yeah. And honestly, the, the digital part looks like a Game Boy, the uh, original Game Boy. It, it does, it yeah. does. That green glow yeah. is just, you know, so uh, nostalgic right now. It is. What's your favorite control on this? My favorite control is definitely the, the fender pull. Oh. Uh, that really, that really, it's just, it's a lifesaver for me. And uh, it's got a highway mode, like a power mode that keeps the, uh, you might know more than me, but I think this keeps the uh, the engine down, like when you're going on highway, it keeps it allows to keep lower RPMs when you're, when you hit the power mode for a little bit more highway stability. The power mode is, uh, actually holds the gear. Uh, in a lower gear more if you if you're stepping um, off the accelerator a bit more oh. yeah so if you want to climb mountains and you don't want it to kick down to a higher gear then you go to the power mode and see, it's electronic control transmission it's ect oh. and the snow mode actually is a sort of traction control that reduces uh torque and goes to a higher gear, higher gear earlier than oh, in normal that's mode so cool. yeah that's so, that's, that's okay, cool. Yeah, that's super awesome. And this is a that's very, very so Toyota thing. Thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty easy. It's a very Toyota thing back in the 90s. Okay. But this, this was special for the Celsius. Okay. The, the, the air suspension, right? Yeah. 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 And luckily, mine's not broken yet. I was really worried about it. Do you know what this one does? So that's actually a shift lock. So if you press this, so you can't actually get out, oh. you hold that. Hold the, uh, the brake pedal down, and it shifts in. But you can actually um, you turn the key off, and you, and you can. You can it's, a, it's, a, it's a security thing. Oh. Early security. Thing. So you see the shift lock. Now it gets it out of gear. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So huh. you just you just shift it. 
My favorite feature is this. You can operate the rear um, controls and also the seat heater for your boss. Yes. <laughs> because he's got controls back there, he just can't be bothered. Yeah, That's you gotta. You got, <laughs> this is part of the Japanese omote nashi, you know, yeah. the husband to, to think, you know, preempt what the boss wants. And just give him a, a you know a, a warm buttock without asking, right? <laughs> In the cold winter. That's actually he. So he can adjust the seat, right? That's back there. But there's no seat heater button back there. Just the seat vibrator. So you have to. Turn you have to turn it for him. Yeah. Ah. He can't even turn his own seat heater on. You know, I think Toyota put that in to test whether you're a good employee or not. <laughs> oh, he's back there. He's like, my butt's cold. Uh, I'm gonna get a new driver next time. Or if he's a businessman, then that's that's for the wife. We've obviously. Oh yeah. Well, that's how it works for me. <laughs> but um, the other the other thing that I really like is this right here. It's this controls uh, earlier version of like the memory for the seat. So you could program it. Uh, there's two settings now. These cars have three. Uh, you can have one for the driver and one also for the owner. So you turn on the car, press that button, and it remembers the previous settings of the height, uh, the seat, uh, you know, uh, distance and also the backrest and everything. And I think these things should be treasured as hallmarks of, you know, 90s Japanese technology, you know. They're, they're pretty cheap now, but that's a good time to snap up, you know. I think Skyline GTRs and Supras are way too expensive, so why not get one of these, right? Yeah, and if you, if you go back like three years, they skyrocket in price. So I expect this will follow suit with the, with the rest. Yeah, I, and, and I hope so. I hope more people can actually appreciate this really, you know, fine piece of um, Japanese engineering. That not everything has to be sports cars. But you know what's funny? Um, Gansan of Best Motoring actually said that this was the first luxury car that could achieve near sports car levels of performance in high speed and stability uh, than any European car at that time. So, so he actually said that it drives better than the Mercedes S-Class. Oh yeah, yeah, overwhelmingly, yeah. <laughs> overwhelmingly. All these Japanese manufacturers were doing what they did best in order to take on Europe. And, you know, what we have now is, you know, just kind of taken for granted. Like, you know, I really feel that, you know, uh, younger viewers or younger buyers out there can appreciate these now actually neoclassics. Yeah. Yeah, and, and with, 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 the, with the JDM wave sweeping across the West, right? You have all, all your sports cars, they're of course at the front of that, right? Uh, thanks to a lot of just publicity and that kind of thing. But you're also kind of starting to become more noticed as like the Bosoku, the VIP guys, and all these kinds of guys. And I think VIP is, is next in that. Like you're gonna start seeing things like Nissan Laurels. Mm, and, they're already quite popular actually. Yeah, thanks, gonna, right? that, all that stuff's gonna be like really like, in, Oh, I hope to see more of this kind of style and people embracing that. You, it goes into the, just the un, unique nature of Japanese enthusiasm. It's just incredible. Yeah, so uh, let's go for a drive. Let's do it. So Kyle, thanks so much for letting us drive your really almost mint condition Toyota Celsius LS400. Wait, hang on. It's a bit confusing, isn't it? It is. It's actually it's very confusing. two cars in the same body. Yeah, yeah. There's the LS400 and the LS400 had like three generations and it shifted. So there was a facelift that happened. Uh, and I think it's different for Japan versus America. You probably know better than me. But this is the facelifted LS400. So it's a UCF21. Right. And yeah, it's got, the, it's got a little bit more of a less boxy design. They moved the turn signals up. And yeah. this is actually uh, the Celsius version, as we explained earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, just getting back in this car, I tested it when it was new, uh, back in 1998, 1999 when it was released. And it still has that classic, timeless elegance, which is simple. You know, back in the day, it was all about understated comfort. and. Um, the Lexus motive, the, the relentless pursuit of perfection. You can really see how each generation has, um, you know, kept on improving, mostly in technology. But what's interesting about this model is that it follows on the basis of the first generation model. In fact, it doesn't look that different. But you know, just drive, just, 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 just keep silent for a minute. You hear that? 
floor actually. That's Enough? the sound of luxury. That is the sound of luxury. <laughs> if you guys like the Celsius or you want to see more of this kind of footage, check out my channel on Amateur Enthusiasm. I appreciate it and I hope that we'll do more with JD Masters in the future. Yes. Thank you, Kyle, for letting us drive and test your nice data Celsius. So please check out his um, uh, Instagram and also YouTube channel and we'll be, you know, if you'd like to do more cooperation in the future. Good. Cool. cool. So we hope you enjoyed that review of the Toyota Celsius, also known as the LS400. Now, if you guys ever consider buying one of these, don't forget that in your home country, you can probably find the equivalent LS400. But there is something special about the Celsius with its wool seats. And if you're interested in the true JDM model, keep the Toyota badge and its specialty. And let us know in the comments if you'd like us to review other luxury Toyota models, like the Crown, for example, the Crown Magister, uh, the Nissan Sima, the Mitsubishi Diamante, there's a whole lot out there. Honda Legend, for example, not just sports cars. And enjoy um, the JDM technology for what it is. So until next time, peace out.